I'm slightly embarrassed to be standing here giving a public lecture because there are so many people who could be giving it. But anyway, I've been given the task, so I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Nancy over there laughing. Uh, she should be up here. Um, I've come, of all the international participants in the workshop, I think I've come the shortest distance just from Singapore. But I had to get up at 4 o'clock this morning, which is 3 o'clock Indonesia time, um, or Jakarta time. So, um, and it's after lunch as well, isn't it? So, yeah, it, um, <laughs> we'll see what happens. But what I'll do is talk, we've got an hour, haven't we? Well, until quarter past two. But I won't go past two, so there'll be time for questions. And uh, we'll kind of see how it goes. Uh, I, I may rush through bits of it because I want to get through by two. I know how annoying it is when people kind of uh, go on. Um, the, the kind of background to this is, I suppose, my own experience of doing work in rural Southeast Asia. And that started off in 1982 in this place, Ban Mon Terre, where I lived for about 10 months, looking at rice variety selection strategy. And uh, this was the village in 82. Here it is in 1994. And here it is when I was last there in 2008. Um, when, when I go back to my field diaries of 1982, there's no inkling, no prescience. I'm not a far-thinking academic who's just kind of looking over the development horizon and appreciating these changes. There's absolutely nothing in there. It's all about smallholder agriculture and how do we boost smallholder agriculture and improve livelihoods by increasing yields and all that sort of stuff. The migration theme, which is the workshop, it, it kind of, there, there were a few people leaving the village, uh, some to work in the Middle East at the time, you know, with the oil price rise and all the rest of it, there was money. So, but I never saw that as a kind of defining, shaping process behind what I was trying to understand. Um, and I suppose thinking about what we're here to talk about for the last, for the next three days, um, there, were th there were three surprises. Um, to me, in retrospect, I mean, it seems blindingly obvious now, but at the time, it wasn't. Um, one was that these small farming households where 80 to 90% of income came from farming would very quickly become non-farm dependent. So it's the kind of first surprise. And that that was based on increasing mobilities. Um, the second one was that despite the increasing mobilities, we could still track down, I mean, this is part of a panel study. So I followed seven, well, 81 households initially from 1981 to, through to 2008 was the last time I did a kind of follow-up study. And in 2008, we could still find 77 of these households. So despite extraordinary change, they were still there, or at least parts of the household were still there. You know, they hadn't kind of left the countryside, they hadn't been uprooted in the way that sort of Deborah was talking about in the African case. Where's she gone? Maybe she's not here, maybe she's lying down. No, there she is. Um, you know, in the African case, where people leave and don't return. There was still that sort of part of the, the household or the family there. Okay, well, this is not really a paper um, as such, or a presentation in the sense of being coherent. It's more a kind of series of vignettes of what I think is important to pick up. And I, I kind of put it together mainly for the workshop. I mean, hopefully it will be interesting for those here who aren't at the workshop as well. But it's mainly as a kind of set of insights into the things that we are discussing at, um, at the workshop. And a lot of it, in fact, picks up on Susanna's position paper and also Christine, the paper that you sent from Ecology and Society. I mean, when I read those, I can see it resonating with what I want to say. First of all, there's this um, kind of challenge of trying to just make sense from a kind of data point of view of what we're looking at. Um, and there's been a lot of work on floating populations. So in Vietnam, probably 12 to 16 million people are living in places where they're not recorded. In China, I understand it's about 225 million. And in Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, again, several million people who we know are actually living where they're not meant to be living. So how do we pick up on that sort of um, degree of mobility? And um, and there was a whole series of UNDP papers on migration in the Human Development Report in 2009. And this quote here, despite our ability to establish these broad contours of movement, what we know is dwarfed by what we don't. And I think that is still a kind of hole in our understanding in terms of the details 
of movement. To give you an example of that, this was a study I worked on in central Thailand, in this village, Ban Kap Mayom. And uh, the first thing we did when we arrived in this village, we wanted to find out what the population was. So we went to the Utai district, the Census Bureau, and they told us that there were 378 people living in the village. We then went to the Tambon, which is the sub-district, and they said, well, actually, no, they're not, they're 425. And then to the health station, and they said, no, there are 1,257 people living in this village. And then we did our own estimate. We reckon there were 3,000. So the kind of, the, the disparity between what is recorded and what is actually there can be enormous. The reason why this village is as it is, is because it's next to an industrial estate. So this is Ban Kok Mayom up here. Um, and this is the industrial estate here, uh, Utia Thailand factory kind of estate. And what is happening is people, of course, are being sucked in from all across Thailand and beyond to Ban Kok Mayom, like these young women here, living in dormitories like this one, Ho Pak, and they are living in the village. They're not kind of of the village. I mean, they're residing there. I would say they're not really living there in that sort of sense of really belonging. But that's what explains this 3,000 people and the disparity between that and what the Census Bureau thinks the population is. And there, that has ramifications. I think a few people have talked about rural depopulation. What's happening is people are leaving these provinces here, and as a result, you're getting an inflow of Lao, who are filling the labor gap in rural areas of northeast Thailand. And in fact, at the moment, I'm examining a, examining a PhD, which is just about this. So the, you know, the number of Lao who speak um, the same language, almost as they speak Lao, they speak Lao in northeast Thailand as well, coming in across the Mekong, usually, well, licitly, so illegally in, in theory, but in practice, everyone um, accepts that it happens to fill that labor gap. And you could argue the reason why there's the labor gap is because of land grabbing in northern Laos. So you kind of got a whole series of resonances across mainland Southeast Asia, which you can track from village to village, from system to system. So that's the kind of first thing, is that how do we get a, a sense of what is going on in detail? The second thing is something which has cropped up a few times this morning, which is about how we interpret histories. And this is about how migration kind of tracks through time. This was a study, a longitudinal study, undertaken again in Northeast Thailand in 1989. And what it shows, I'll just quickly explain, these are male, my, male householders, these are female, farming and non-farming. So this is the pattern of farm work and non-farm work. And if you look at this graph, it seems as though non-farm work, which often involves migration, is a kind of rite of passage. These are young, unmarried men and women leaving home, probably going to work in places like that industrial estate I showed earlier, maybe becoming a sort of domestic workers in Bangkok or maybe traveling abroad. Then they're coming back, if you like, getting married, having children, settling down and becoming farmers again. So this picture from 1989, these data, kind of indicate what well, you might think that this is about a rite of passage. These are the same village 10 years on, so two or 11 years on in 2000. And you can kind of see what's happening, the way in which if you look at this, you might say, well, actually, there's an era-defining process of change going on here, that these young migrants are not coming back, or at least they're staying away for longer. And then looking at this second graph, it kind of raises a whole set of questions about the reproduction of the farm household, how agriculture is going to be sustained, how you know, households are becoming separated over space in the long term and not just in the short term. And I suppose that's what I've found myself doing all the time, is playing kind of explanatory catch-up. You know, I go out into, say, rural Laos or Vietnam or Thailand, and I see one thing and I write papers that no one reads, which might be about how this is a rite of passage, and then you go back ten years later and you think, right, okay, something else is going on here, and you write something else. So you're always trying to just sort of, at least for someone who was based in the UK until last July, just trying to kind of keep pace with um, change in places like um, Northeast Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, wherever in Southeast Asia. 
And in fact, these are my data from showing something very similar. So this is 1982, and this is 2008. So a similar sort of process. Um, and I, I know Becky's written on this, but you also see, if you like, female, female mobility becoming very much more the norm than in 82. So a sort of opening of the moral envelope of who can move and who can't. Um, and I know sort of Becky's work is even more dramatic, her work on Lampung. What's interesting, though, is that even when people stay away for years and years, and this is where it's different from Deborah's work on Africa, where she was saying that people don't see themselves as farmers. If you like, they're temporary, you know, even though they may be away for, well, whoops, 14 or 13 years, they're still beholden to their rural origins. And I don't know whether that's a difference between, say, Latin America, Africa, and the Asian experience. I suspect that there are some important differences there. But um, this is work from Vietnam that we undertook in 2010. These people who have been in Hanoi for over a decade and still have temporary residence and are not giving up that temporary residence. So they're still maintaining important links back to their places of origin. That, of course, then means that we have multi-sited households. And various people have mentioned that this morning and multi-sited livelihoods. So this sort of thing, um, where you will have a, where you'll have a grandparent looking after grandchildren while the parents of the grandchildren are working away. So a sort of reworking of the household, of course, both in the way it's kind of spatial footprint, but also then in the way that it operates as a social unit. Um, and you'll find grandparents complaining that after their grandchildren, they don't understand them. And some of the issues, for example, in the Philippines, where you've got real frictions within the household as they try to deal with these new household forms. And, and of course, sometimes the change is really dramatic. This is um, another panel study, just to give you an idea of how dramatic it is. So this was from 1981. This is the agriculture, non-agricultural uh, division of income, 40-60, and in situ at 60, 60-40. And this was it in 2002. So you can see how the, these, ha these villages have been reworked, both in terms of where income is coming from and where activity is situated. And behind, of course, that is migration. Um, but as I said at the outset, people are not giving up their land yeah, they're still keeping hold of their land. So the, the village we've been working in for nearly 30 years now, you've still got 85% of a population maintaining control of their land. And that's a really different from the agrarian transition as it emerged, say, in Western Europe, where, if you like, the departure of people from rural areas to urban areas usually led, I mean, sometimes it was forced, so land was possessed, was um, dispossessed, people giving up their land. And there's an interesting debate, um, I mean, Gillian Hart, on, you know, is Asia an example of accumulation without dispossession? Whereas somewhere like Africa and Latin America, maybe it's a case of accumulation with dispossession. Um, so people in most countries of East Asia, so Southeast and East Asia, have not lost their land in the way that they have, say, in Africa and Latin America. So what we have is kind of capitalist accumulation based on the assumption that people still have their land. So they still have a kind of subsistence base, but that's freeing up labor then to work in the industrial sectors. And in a way, villages then become sustained through absence. This is a picture of Tenghua in Vietnam. And it, we, we were interviewing migrants in Hanoi, and then we went back to their places of origin. And we turn up in villages and find this sort of thing. So people still have their house, they still have their land, but they're not occupied. And if the land is used, it's farmed by someone else. But in an odd sort of way, it's because people are not there that the village still exists. It's because of the kind of cross subsidization of migration and migrant lives and livelihoods, non-farm income, back into the village that allows some people to stay there. Which then, that puzzle of how come we could still find 77 of our households, it was because of this sort of thing. People kept their land, 
they may not have farmed it. I mean, there's been some places like Malaysia, lots of idle land. Uh, in Thailand, some de kind of, I suppose, disintensification of agriculture. And um, there's a scholar called Deirdre Mackay who writes about remittance landscapes, that we can kind of read the landscapes of Asia in the sense that they are shaped by remittances, what crops people grow, how they grow them, how they use mechanization of production, all those sorts of things can be understood in terms of patterns of remittances. So what happens to farming, a sort of third theme? Um, well, you get a geriatrification of farming. Um, so this was, again, the study that we've been doing in Northeast Thailand. So the average mean age of the farmers was 36 years old in 82, and it's now 55. So you've got a kind of aging of the farm labor force over time. Um, this was a transplant gang that we came across. And uh, we, we sort of talked to them. We, so we, we asked them, you know, how old are you? And they're all in their 60s and 70s. I mean, these people shouldn't be transplanting rice. And we said, where are all the young people? And some of them said, ah, oh, well, they've all gone to Bangkok. And then someone else said, no, no, they're not. They're in the village, but they're too lazy to come out here and work. You know, the agriculture, farming, this sort of really hard transplant work is kind of beneath them. They've attained secondary school education, and they haven't left the village, but they've kind of left the agricultural workforce. So there was a kind of debate among these farmers about whether youth were completely useless and lazy, or whether actually they'd gone off to do something uh, useful in the city. But you wouldn't have seen, I mean, back in 1980, you wouldn't have seen this sort of pattern of aged um, transplant gang. And so, I mean, I think a lot of the changes you see in agriculture, I've got some of them here, disintensification, land use changes, cropping, idle land mechanization, all those sorts of things, are linked in one way or another to migration. I mean, of course, uh, I suppose an interesting question is the direction of causality. Um, I mean, people like James Scott, you know, his work on Malaysia would probably say that mechanization has led to migration rather than migration leading to mechanization. So if you have mechanization, it displaces labor from work. Um, I think in his book he calls the combine harvester, doesn't he call it mesin makan karja, the machine that eats work. I think that's what it's called in the village at Seleka, that somehow it takes work away from the landless and the land poor. And as a result, they become the, you know, disempowered migrants going off to... Um, KL or wherever, but other people see it working the other way around. Um, and I, I suppose the classic case is Japan. I don't know if anyone works in Japan here. Um, but, you know, the average size of farm, 1.89 hectares, 85% of farmers are part-time. I don't know whether this is an Asian future, uh, you know, whether we'll see this kind of get reproduced elsewhere. Um, the number of farmers between 1960 and 2004 dropped from 12.2 million to 2.2 million. Apparently in 2009, 66,000 people took up farming, but only 1,850 um, were from non-farming backgrounds. So they've got no one kind of entering farming. And the average age of farmers exceeded 65 for the first time in 2010. So it's now around about 65.8. So, you know, whether that's going to be the feature of, um, yeah, in many areas, just 10% of farmers have a son, daughter willing to take over the farm. So the kind of interesting questions about the reproduction of the farm household over time. And I don't know, any Australians here, I mean, that program, um, find, your, well, find the farmer a wife, you know, that desperate attempt to find someone who's going to marry the Australian farmer stuck out in the outback. Um, <laughs> that's, um, and the same happens in South Korea. So um, I had a... I don't know if we've got any South Koreans here. I had a South Korean uh, postgraduate who translated, he said that, well, he took the photo for me. And apparently it says this, marry a Vietnamese woman, innocent and good-natured. And then this one, Vietnamese wives guaranteed never to run away. Uh, but, um, I mean, sort of in, amusing at one level, tragic at another. But, I mean, the, this, you know, if you like, the, the movement of... Vietnamese women to South Korea to fill the void because, you know, male farmers can't find wives. You know, that, that's the degree to which, if you like, this question of the reproduction of the farm household is being pushed. Um, which is this theme. Um, so if we've got this sort of pattern, and that question I posed earlier, you know, is this temporary or is it permanent? You know, is this something that's going to, you know, as 
as people finish, you know, work, as they, as they mature, they come back to the village, they get married, they settle down, they take up farming. So is that the pattern? Or is this indicative of a much longer term, more profound, deeper seated sort of uh, household footprint? Um, the, uh, I think the kind of surprise is that households in, I would say, in East Asia in general are getting smaller. I mean, total fertility rates now in most country, I think Indonesia, I think it's about 2.1, is it? 2.2, something like that? Barely replacement. I think in, in Vietnam and Thailand, it's under two. And yet households are becoming more complex. So they're getting smaller and more complex. So this was the households in 82. Here are the households in 2008. And you can see this dramatic increase in grandchildren being brought up by their grandparents, so the point I made earlier. And so, at a kind of conceptual level, there's a question about what is the household. I think classically, I don't know if we've got any anthropologists here, but isn't, I think a household is a co-residential dwelling unit. Um, I mean, all the households that I've been talking about are not co-residential dwelling units. So do we need to kind of rethink how we understand households? And that second question about what's the future going to hold? Um, at the moment, I'm working with um, some colleagues in Konken University on the middle income gap. Um, and what we're doing here is kind of, it, 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 you'll see it links, but um, what we're doing here is we're kind of, we, we've notionally divided migrants up into first generation and second generation. So the first generation, essentially the ones who left with primary level education and they went into low-skilled work in um, manufacturing, domestic work, construction sites, that sort of thing, from the second generation, who have mostly got um, lower secondary school or above. So this is the kind of distinction between first and second generation. And of course, the first generation, they left the village as farmers. Um, so men like this, I think I took this about 19, well, I put here, around about 1990. So they took up this sort of work. And I think if I'd gone up to these two men and asked them, what are you? They would have said, they're farmers. That was their kind of elemental positioning, if you like. And these, as I showed this picture earlier, these are the migrants, the second generation migrants. These men and women, they're not farmers. Often they've never farmed. They don't know how to farm. Because they will have gone through probably nine or 12 years of schooling. And immediately their schooling finishes, they will have gone off somewhere else. So that kind of sense of being tied to the land, of having the knowledge of farming, is not ingrained in them in the way that the two men in the picture behind are. So there's a sort of argument that the migrants of the 1980s were sojourning farmers. Return was always what was going to happen to them. But maybe the migrants of the 2000s, so the last decade or so, are kind of school leavers. We have to think about them as different people. Um, this is the pattern of schooling between the first generation in blue, almost all primary, and then the second generation in, I suppose that's magenta or something like that, isn't it? Um, and um, what's interesting, though, is that very few of them, and this is another puzzle, become permanent migrants. Um, it is a bit tricky because, of course, you, if you ask a household, well, is your son or daughter going to remain permanently, away permanently, they might say, no, no, he, she's going to come back next year, but then it might turn out that they don't. So I, I know this is sort of hypothetical, but we interviewed or we, we sourced information on about 150 um, migrants, and you can see around about 50 had returned by the time we did the survey. Another altogether 120 were expected to return, a small number were marriage migrants, so they'd left because they'd got married to someone somewhere else. And a very small number, just 22, 15% of the total, had become permanent migrants. Which is kind of a surprise that they're not, yeah, despite the fact they don't have farm skills, despite the fact they don't want to go into farming, despite the fact they're educated to secondary level, they're still seen and usually see themselves as temporary movers. And I, I've been kind of thinking about why this is. Um, and I, th I think it might be, uh, there's some interesting work going on at the moment, mostly in Europe, although it's beginning in Asia, on what's known as precarity. So precarious living. And I think 
this is becoming kind of increasingly a, a problem for these migrants. This is a graph um, of formal against informal sector employment. And you can see, this is kind of what, when was the informal sector discovered by the ILO? I think about 1975, wasn't it, or something like that. So here we have informal sector comprising over three quarters of total employment. And during the two decades from 1980, you see it falling here for Thailand. This is what's happened since then. It's kind of stagnated. So you, you have the sort of informalization of the formal sector. What you see emerging is not an informal sector, but an informal economy. And a lot of the jobs that these young men and women have in Bangkok or in Manila or in Jakarta, I suspect don't, they're precarious. Yeah, there's, so the issue of precarity, they're, um, they're fixed term, they're contract based, they're casual. Yeah, and so keeping hold of the land and a foot in, in rural areas makes sense in terms of how they're getting incorporated into the industrial workforce. Um, okay, then I've, I've got, um, well, kind of a discussion here about the urbane villager um, and what is urban. Uh, this links to um, some really nice work by someone called Eric Thompson, who's a sociologist, mostly of Malaysia, where he says, let's stop thinking about urban as what we know and think of urban being, which is kind of buildings and houses and built up space, and think of urban as a way of living. And then we can see kind of urbanity infiltrating rural space. So people like the, this couple who I, um, I interviewed, this is a photo I took, I think way back in 1980, and we were talking about it. But these are really sophisticated um, women now, particularly the daughter standing behind her mother. Um, people putting up houses which are emblematic of what it is to be urban in a rural context. And uh, Eric Thompson talking about social, socially urban, Charles Kai's Rural Cosmopolitans, and Andrew Walker of Middle Income Peasants. So if you like scholars, I mean, Andrew Walker's an anthropologist, um, Eric Thompson is a sociologist, and Charles Kai's, um, I guess, an anthropologist, isn't he? Um, kind of using different terms, but I think they're all picking up on the same thing, which is about how migration is not just leading to remittances coming back, it's a whole set of social remittances which are redefining how people act and behave and interact and what they hold dear and so forth. Um, and this is Charles Kai's. Uh, Northeastern families today have become increasingly cosmopolitan because they are linked to a global labor force, have sophisticated understandings of Bangkok <coughs> society, and yet still retain long-standing resentment for being looked down upon as country bumpkins. And I mean, he makes a point in this article that there are probably more, well, he, he suggests, more rural peasants in Thailand have passports than do the urban lower middle class because they're the ones who kind of go out to Singapore and Brunei and Korea and wherever to secure work. So in an odd sort of way, they're more worldly. Men like this man, who I first interviewed in 1980, more world, I mean, he's been abroad, more worldly than the people's, most of the people in Bangkok. Um, and then you get cartoons like this, which um, sees the rural masses as a bunch of kind of idiot buffalo who are just following each other. This is the sort of thing that really grates with um, the rural population. Right, I've got one more. I think this is the last. I've got. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I've, I've just put this in because we, we had an interesting, I know some of you weren't there. We had an interesting discussion about history. And um, this is a great, I don't know if anyone who knows this painting. It's a fantastic painting. Um, and as you can see, it's called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus by Peter Bruegel the Elder. And you kind of look at it and you think, well, where, where, why is it called landscape um, with the fall of Icarus? And then if you look, because you've got a man here plowing his land and a ship sailing into the distance, and here's Icarus falling into the sea. And W.H. Auden, the um, poet, wrote this, one of his poems. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster the plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had on the white legs disappearing into the green water, 
and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere else to get to and sailed calmly on. And I, this kind of about the histories that we describe, that we get kind of caught up in the big events and we somehow expect those big events to be inscribed in the everyday lives of plowmen like this guy here. When of course it may be that actually those big events mean little or maybe they intersect with the small, you know, everyday living in ways that we don't anticipate. So I mean, I think this, occasionally I show my students this slide as a way of kind of, I suppose, divorcing big history, the way we understand it, from everyday living and asking them to think about the connections between the two. Right? I've done it in time. <laughs>